All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We've got a pretty good turnout today. It's exciting to see. Uh, my name is Peter Oreo. I know a lot of folks. Um, I've met a lot of folks. I see a lot of folks out names I know on the uh, attendance list. Welcome. Thank you for joining tonight. I'm going to talk about uh, LDI prostate brachytherapy today. We're going to talk about common mistakes to avoid and technical tips for a high quality implant. There we go. All right, so what I want to talk about today is patient selection. This is paramount because if you select the wrong person for brachytherapy, you may um, have you know, suboptimal outcomes. I want to talk about anatomy. What we implant is what we treat. And if we implant the wrong things, then we can cause toxicity. Talk about some technical considerations, pitfalls, and some tips and tricks I've learned over the years doing all of this stuff. Anytime I talk about prostate brachytherapy, um, obviously it's a passion of mine. And today we're going to talk about low dose rate brachytherapy. We're putting radiation seeds directly within the prostate. They're permanent and they stay. Obviously, we also have high dose rate prostate brachytherapy where we put catheters into the prostate and we let, let an iridium source sort of uh, dwell in positions and then come out to a temporary implant. All brachytherapy is good brachytherapy, but today we're talking about low dose rate brachytherapy. When I talk about brachytherapy, I think it's something that we always you know, sort of have debates on what's best, how we do things, how do we um, live in the world of radiation beam and IMRT. You know, I always say we see what we want to see. Some of you looking at this picture on the screen are seeing an old woman. Some of you are seeing a young lady. And this is important because when we talk about prostate brachytherapy and the PSA controls and survivals, which are much better than beam, especially in the high risk settings, People will say, well, there's no overall survival benefit. So what's the point? Well, the point is we keep people from salvage therapies, toxic therapies, and if patients live long enough, I know it's gonna manifest into a survival benefit. Brachytherapy is the ultimate team sport. Uh, we know this, we need a urologist, radiation oncologist, physicist, most of the time in the OR at one place at one time. It takes longer to do than it does to just circle a um, prostate. Just making sure you all can hear me and just looking at the chat real quick. And of course, there's been some financial considerations that brachytherapy has been reimbursed a little bit, you know, less than IMRT for a multitude of reasons. And so there's some disincentives of getting it done, even though we know it's probably the best thing we can offer to patients when they're properly selected. All right, so let's talk a little bit about patient selection. You know, there are different things we have to pay attention to. If a guy comes in, he has a lot of hypertrophy, he's just miserable, he's dribbling, he can't even push his urine through the prostate to begin with, prostate brachytherapy is probably not the best thing for this individual because of the high probability with some swelling, we're going to choke off the urethra and he may need to self-catheterize. Now there's different maneuvers that we can go. We could try to set or reduce. We could try to do a chirp, a whole bunch of stuff. But, you know, if someone is struggling to begin with and that prostate's causing a lot of grief, you know, maybe we want to kind of, give another modality of therapy instead of brachytherapy. But again, there's ways around this too. I spend a lot of time with my patients looking at the IPSS scores. I find this to be very beneficial, but I also find that sometimes patients don't truly really understand what they're circling and it sometimes requires a little bit of discussion. If we have high IPSS scores, basically I'm looking for obstructive-like symptoms. Again, if the prostate is just a big ball that's you know just pushing on the urethra and they can't pee, then brachytherapy becomes a little more difficult to perform. These are the guys that are going to have you know, lots of troubles in the back end of the procedure. So we want to either know that's going to happen and you know, treat accordingly or you know, make sure that we really want to bring those folks to the operating room to put seeds in. But you know, sometimes they don't really know how to fill this out and they miss, make a few mistakes. So we really want to try to pay attention that they're you know, really treating up obstructive-like symptoms. And so we say relative contraindications. Now, these things are all changing. This is what the ABS guidelines look like as of today, but new guidelines are um, actually in trust now. Um, but, you know, a high IPSS score is greater than 20. But again, that's how a patient fills things out. If you're, on, if you're borderline, you want to sort of see if you can actually do it. I like urine dynamics. If they have a PVL less than 100 cc's and a peak flow greater than 10 cc's a second, I find these guys will do just well fine. You know, we always said a prior history of pelvic radiation. Now we have space ores that we can push the rectum out of the way. So this is becoming a little less of an issue, but something we have to pay attention to. If they have trip deficits, you know, they could urinate out seeds, especially if they're put in loose. Large median lobes may be um, associated with greater uh, need to catheterize after implant. And we have to pay attention to this, but there's ways around it by doing a median lobectomy. Uh, there's ways around... Um, <clears throat> You know, just not simply implanting if we don't think there's cancer. 
Gland size is something that's always been interesting. We always have said greater than 60 because of pubic arch interference or less than 20 because there's just no places, you know, less places to put the seeds. But really it's your comfort level. You can implant a whole lot bigger and a whole lot smaller. In fact, I just finished a seven cc implant just last week. The problem we're, we're starting to face now is a lot of folks are getting combined modality therapy. They've gotten beam, they've gotten hormonal therapy in a you know normal size 30, 40 cc prostate becomes 20 cc's pretty quickly. Um, so either you know, we have to adapt to be able to take care of these things. Probably not the implants you want to start out with, but in time and with a good program, I'll show you some tricks that these can be done. Inflammatory bowel disease we mentioned as well. All right. And I know uh, we have uh, Dr. Merrick on the line and a few others today, but you know, can we, can we treat plant, uh, glands less than 20 cc's? Absolutely. I mean, the data has been there for an awful long time. I do this on a very, very routine basis. In fact, most of the prostates I implant are small just because of the kind of combined modality. You can still have your V100s and your D90s hold up. You just have to be careful where you're playing the seed. You have to pay particular attention to the urethra and where the urethra is. You know, I think the mid gland, mid urethra can spend a whole lot more dose than they can at the, um, at the apex and you know, the membrane urethra going down to the GU diaphragm. That's where we get into our troubles, what strictures and whatnot. And we'll go through that again today as well. And there are ways you can kind of cool the urethra off. Now I do a lot of link seeds and I like to do that because I can you know, kind of bind hold the, the lateral aspect of the prostate in places. And here's an example of just moving one seed out to kind of the peripheral um, you know, slice above. It's actually caught into the prostate it's gonna migrate with the prostate. You can pull the 125 off the urethra, which is um, the yellow in this, uh, in this particular picture. Uh, things like this can be done if you want, if you're not afraid to put things on and around the capsule, you can definitely spare the urethra a bit better than otherwise. Of course, there's some playing difficulties and because you know, we say pubic arch interference and that's what happens when you have a very big prostate or a very small pelvis, it's really no absolute size limitation. And, I was uh, out in South Africa talking and, you know, someone said, hey, listen, every time you say 20 to 60, the insurance companies pick up on that. So they won't pay for an implant if the prostate's less than 20 or greater than 60. So we probably should get away with that, get away from saying it like that. But you have to be comfortable implanting. And of course, you don't want the pubic arch to get in the way of your needles. Like in the next picture, I'll show you some uh, tricks to kind of get around some of this stuff. Uh, again, you know, big prostates, things like this, potential for more morbidity, more seeds, more needles, more punctures, the potential for swelling. Um, and if that's going to happen, you want to make sure you manage that appropriately after the implant. And we'll discuss that. Obviously, large chirps, if you're putting in loose seeds, you know, less place of real estate to put the seeds. And also, if you put a loose seed in a deficit, you could urinate it out. So you have to pay attention to where these chirps are and whether or not um, you feel comfortable implanting these individuals. Uh, median lobes, another thing. Technically, a little bit more of a challenge. Up, obviously, up near the bladder, going to give more dose to the bladder walls and whatnot. Can't, you know, they have the potential for urinary retention. These can be just slobbed off or they can even sometimes be ignored. But again, it really depends on the patient, your comfort level and you know, what you're trying to accomplish. <clears throat> you know, with pubic arch interference, there are a couple of things that can be done. I mean, obviously, if the pubic arch is, you know, kind of window shading uh, the prostate and you want to put a seed right up here, that becomes a little more problematic because your needle is going to get deflected. You can do more of an extended dorsal, you know, lithotomy position where now you're pushing the legs up, you're pushing the, the pubic arch up a little higher. You can usually get some space to go in. Um, sometimes you're in the middle of an implant, you notice this a little bit, you can save that needle for the end and go hyperextend the legs and get that seed in where you need to put it. You can also tilt the probe anteriorly. You got to be careful though, because you don't want to, you know, barely leave the apex seeds too close to the rectum. You can steer the needles. And sometimes, um, depending on the setup you have, where your stepper stabilizers are, you can actually do a little reverse trim Dellenberg to kind of uh, pivot everything and torque everything up just a little bit. And sometimes you can slide right underneath the pubic arch if it's, uh, if it's causing interference. The absolute contraindications, well, limited life expectancy. If the patient's not gonna live very long and they gotta have something else, probably don't wanna even be bothering with their prostate cancer, of course, if they're unacceptable operative risks. You know, we used to say distant metastasis. However, with oligometastatic protocols, we're treating the prostate quite a bit and up to you know, four lesions within the body from some of the emerging data. Um, so to me, you know, prostate brachytherapy remains on the table. Uh, these are the older kind, older guidelines. Uh, very large drug deficits, as we've mentioned, limited seed replacement if you have uh, radiation genetic disorders or an absence of a rectum. Although when we have guys who need brachy and they don't have a rectum, we can point them under MR guidance. So there's ways around that too. Is brachy okay for young patients? And this is something that comes up quite a bit. You know, the urologists of old would say, well, for patients, you know, young, especially less than six, they're going to go straight to the operating room. I don't subscribe to that. I mean, we have plenty of data and Dr. Merrick has you know, shown that you can do 
um, brachytherapy for young guys, still get excellent control. I mean, honestly, if you're not going to fail after five years of brachy, you're probably not going to fail. The issue becomes, though, when people kind of come up in tumor boards is, well, you just gave that guy radiation. They're in their 50s or you know, even pinpoint guys in the late 40s. That's what I am. And this is what I would want if I had prostate cancer. So I do it. But, you know, what are you doing? What's the secondary risk? You just gave someone who has a lot of years left on their radiation. I say, well, I've also spared them from incontinence and erectile dysfunction, but that's a different argument. But if you look at some of the SEER studies, I'm looking at over 200,000 patients with 16 years follow-up, there's really no excess risk with brachytherapy compared to baseline, but there is a little more of a risk with external beam, which makes sense. You have this integral dose because you're kind of bathing tissues to get to the prostate versus just putting the radiation on the prostate itself. You're basically ablating the prostate with radiation. So, you know, you're killing it anyway, so there's really very little to transform. And you're very careful on the doses of the rectum and the bladder. But, you know, the other question is that comes up, well, what's the radiation exposure to the spouse say from brachytherapy? Is this patient at risk walking around? And, you know, Dr. Mikulski uh, did a nice little study where we put radiation detectors on everybody to include the family pet. And the reality is the spouse was getting very little radiation dose, 0.1 millisieverts. If you fly from Boston to San Francisco, you're going to get 0.12. So basically the exposure to others is minimal. So younger, you know, men, they have children, kids around, things like that. Still, they're not much of a risk to anybody around them. And of course, we know the inverse square is such that you, know, you go a foot away from these patients, there's no dose or exposure. The other thing that comes up, especially in the younger patients is, you know, in the old days, it was a blind biopsy. It was a random sample. So we thought we had six, maybe we had into, you know, fibrillin intermediate risk sub, you know, the three plus equals seven fibrillin intermediate. But who knew, you know, it's blind. I mean, what if you had something right over here and the needle was offset a millimeter and this guy actually had nine? I mean, of course, we might be under treating if we're just doing break by itself. So that's a little concerning, especially when you inherit young guys and you're going to have them, you know, on your panel for the next 20, 30 years or more, hopefully, right? But, you know, so what we do now is we make sure everybody has multi-parametric MRIs of the prostate. Why? Because let's go take a look. Why, you know, why not? I mean, there's no sense just doing a random sample and telling me that this is what you have. I want to know what you have. So, you know, we do a lot of MRI work. And of course, our practice, at least in Boston, has really shifted that everyone gets an MR uh, trust fusion biopsy. You very see very few folks with uh, blind uh, random biopsies anymore, which is nice because one, I have an MRI that I can use for my brachytherapy planning. But two, I feel more comfortable that if there's a dominant nodule, we've seen it and we put a needle in it and we really have an idea of what the person actually has. Because again, we treat by biopsy score. And we want to make sure it's correct, especially when we're you know, treating younger patients for a long time to live. Also, too, we know recurrences happen at the dominant nodule. If I have this MRI, I know where to augment my dose when I'm doing prostate brachytherapy. I also insist, and I recommend that everybody does the same, do a colonoscopy prior to implant. I need to have a colonoscopy within two years of implant. If they had one three years ago, they're getting another one if they want me to implant them. Why? You want to rule out rectal pathology. You know, we're oncologists. You can do an implant and you can see someone in fault and say, you know, Mr. Jones, you're due for a colonoscopy. Let's get that done. Well, what if you did the implant when they had this severe dysplasia and then you did a colonoscopy a year later and it's turned into an adenocarcinoma? Well, the detractors are going to say that's a radiation-induced tox uh, malignancy. Now it existed. So I make sure that the rectum is completely clean before I bring anyone to the OR to, you know, to rule out any of those transformations, which would, uh, radiation would get blamed for. But also too, you know, if rectal fistula is the most severe thing that we can do with brachytherapy surgery for that matter too, high dose SBRT too, by the way, is fistulas. But what do we do? It's a comedy of errors. Too much dose to the, so the anterior rectal wall. Right. Well, we've got ways to avoid that nowadays. We can put spacers in place if we made a mistake. But also, really, what triggers it? It's someone who gets a biopsy immediately after the implant and they see some pallor and they start to take big chunks of tissue out of the rectal wall. Well, that may not heal. If that doesn't heal, it might require surgery. Some of those guys who require surgery and might end up with a colostomy. This is not just cover your butt. You know, if you've done this upfront, it's not going to get done at least within the first year afterwards or two years afterwards. So, again, something nice to know. One, Secondary malignancy, don't get blamed for it too. Don't cause a person any problems with an inappropriate biopsy. Now, let's talk about anatomy. Now, location, location, location. It's all about anatomy. You treat what you see, what you contour. If you contour the wrong thing, you're treating the wrong thing. So you need to really know your anatomy. 
Now we all know the zonal anatomy of the prostate. We also know the peripheral zone is gonna harbor the majority of uh, cancers. When I do an implant, I light up the peripheral zone to 150% of my dose, because I know, you know, I've got MRIs, I've got biopsies, but there could be some other stuff harboring out there. I also know that dose matters. The more I give, the higher probability I'm gonna cure. So, but anatomy, and this is the important thing. I, you know, I think a lot of what's happened you know, with prostate brachytherapy, at least the, distract, the, the detractors out there will say, well, there's a lot of toxicity with it. So why would I want to do that? I want the patients calling me. I want my patients cured. But with that said, it's really easy to contour the external sphincters when you're doing ultrasound-based, um, um, you know, contouring. You know, you really have to understand the anatomy. You know, there's a lot of variability. Sometimes these sphincters are a millimeter away from the apex of the prostate. Sometimes they're almost a centimeter. And that really kind of leads into why some guys are wet as wet can be after a prostatectomy and some aren't. Because really, it's just the variation in anatomy. But you got to understand this and realize this. Because if you circle this, it looks circular. It could be a prostate, but it's not. And if you circle that, you're treating that. If you're treating that, you're probably getting a lot of dose of the membrous urethra. Those are the guys who get strictures. And that's what we get blamed for, right? So... You know, we got to know our anatomy. You know, external sphincter, external sphincter, you can now see the levitana ani becomes more of an hourglass. We kind of have a sense of where it is. This is important because you have the MRI, you can measure out what you might see in ultrasound. We confuse it to ultrasound, but if you don't have that capability, at least you know what the length will be. Now, external sphincter, a little bit of prostate apex coming in, prostate. So these are the places where we can get in trouble. And obviously, as we go to mid gland, it's a lot easier to see. But, you know, you got to be careful, too. This is the peripheral zone. That's not the prostate. It, it, this colors, right? You know, some folks will say, well, this is the prostate. No, this is all the prostate. So, you know, I would say this is all from prostitutal play with it. Understand it. Because you also want to understand where your bladder neck is coming in. Because you don't want to be circling your bladder neck and giving dose to the bladder and putting seeds in the bladder. Otherwise, you're going to have spasms. You're going to be using anticholinergics, which, you know, you prefer not to do. Again, understand where the bladder muscles are and to avoid implant. And then up to some of the vesicles, of course. But definitely take some time. Use prostadoodle because it actually will make your CT contouring a whole lot better too. Um, when you start to understand you know, sort of what to look for and you know some of the tricks to um, identify places that we don't want to give external radiation and we sure we don't want to give seeds. Well, high dose rate for that matter. Ultrasound quality is important. You know, I'm of the generation I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, which is um, simply amazing to me. But you know, I started out with the, you know, animal series of, you know, the DNK ultrasounds and you didn't see a whole lot, you know, you saw what you saw and you realize we're implanting the seminal vesicles all the time because they just all kind of melted in. Um, you know, the dorsal plexus up there, these up, you know, on the old ultrasounds, that looked a whole lot like a prostate. So you really had to know, now we can see these nice distinctions. So having good ultrasounds is important, um, you know, especially if you're starting out a program, invest in a good ultrasound because you implant what you see, it makes your life a whole lot easier. Now the apex identification to me is one of the most important things that we do, because if we overdose below the apex is a high probability that we could, you know, cause guys urinary grief, need medications. In worst case, we can cause a stricture, which nobody likes. So if you have an MRI, you can use a cognitive fusion. Just take a look at it, know what the length, width, height are, use that in your planning and understand how long it is. And if you go way, way down here, probably over contoured. Uh, in sagittal, you can sweep your prostate. When you sweep it, you can start to follow the curves down. You can see the apex better. It's difficult when you're just looking at transverse or just midline, um, just a midline um, apical um, sagittal slice. You're really doing the sweep helps you understand of where things are going. But my favorite trick, and it was really born out of frustration in the OR with some of my residents, and I was trying to explain where the apex was, and we're chatting, and I just said, finally, someone grab me a needle before I strangle one of you. And but I'm actually very nice, so I didn't strangle anybody. But we just put a needle in, you pop, you talk, you push on the prostate, you can feel the capsule, you can push the prostate around. There it is. I leave the needle in. So when I'm doing interoperative planning, I'm doing my you know, sagittal based implant. I know where the apex was. I'm not going to go past it. Just kind of a gut check to know you're not going too well, because again, going low can cause issues, you know, and tears, dragging seeds down to the membranous urethra. This is where strictures typically happen. You know, a patient comes in 18 months later and says, you know, gee, doc, when I pee, man, it, burns and hurts at the tip of my penis. Yeah, that's a stricture. Um, and you know, the, the incidence rate is about two to 7%. You now it looked like it was a little bit higher in the ascend RT trial. That was the, you know, the dose escalated trial, external beam versus radiation and brachy. Um, why? I think, you know, we look at some of the uh, outcomes, some of the data sets, some of the seeds are being dragged. So we really, 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 really want to avoid doing this. And so knowing where your apex is, is really paramount. 
and there's, you know, simple ways of getting that done. We also don't want to, you know, you know, we don't want to purposely implant the bladder wall. And we want good base coverage, but we don't want to be putting seeds into the bladder wall. Now you can see a lot of this stuff if you pay attention to your sagittal imaging, you're going to see it. Um, you can also feel for it, you know, the prostate bladder interface. I remember when I was, you know, way back then, we would sometimes, you know, kind of push through the bladder just to see what it felt like. Because once you do it once, you know what it feels like. It's not going to hurt anything, but you don't want, you want to know where the seeds are going to go. Um, obviously, you don't want them in the bladder uh, wall because it can cause bladder spasms. And usually these guys have been taking into the colon nerdics for a long time and cause hematuria, radiation cystitis, the whole thing. And since it's a low, but again, don't implant it if you don't have to, because typically you don't. You just have to not lose your anatomy. Let's talk about some technical considerations. Now, there's different implant philosophies, and folks have heard me talk before. I say all implants are good implants in terms of just be good at what you do. You know, pre-planning versus interoperative planning versus interactive and the holy grail dynamic dose calculations. It's all great, but it's really, it's only as great as you are in terms of what you know how to do well. If you can do a great pre-plan, great. That's what you should do. If you like interoperative and you're good at it, well, then do that. But just whatever you do, get good at now, pre-planning, as we know, you create a plan outside the OR days a week before the procedure, intraoperative planning, you do the plan in the OR, and some benefits, the patient remains stationary between the volume study and the implant procedure, so you're not trying to manipulate the patient back to where they were a week or two before in the pre-planning. I do interactive planning, where you revise the planning periodically during the procedure based on needle positions. It becomes a surrogate for the seeds. We can actually see the seeds pretty well, but I we wouldn't say anyone can see the seeds 100%, and that would be the dynamic dose calculation, which I don't think we're quite there yet, but I know industry is definitely working on. So pre-planning, as you know, it's a two-stage procedure. You do a volume study, you do all the planning at your leisure. You go, you order your seeds, your strands, or your needles, preloaded, or have you make cartridges, whatever you want to do, but basically you execute in the OR. So it's quick, it's nice, and basically you get the patient in the position, put the seeds in, it goes pretty quick. The disadvantage is that this you know, concordance between the plan and the execution. We've all been in times where we're trying to get the patient back in the same position and for some reason you're just not. In these days of boost and everything else when the prostate can continue to shrink because of ADT, it's a different. So um, it becomes a little more difficult, but there's workarounds and you just have to understand what you're doing. And of course you wanna make a robust plan so you can plan against any uh, changes. Of course, when you're doing pre-planning and you're doing multiple implants in the day, I try to you know, maximize my day. So I like to do three to five implants in the morning or whatnot. Um, you know, but pre-planning, you make sure you have the right seeds for the right patient because that becomes a medical event if you put someone else's seeds in that patient. Uh, patient positioning errors, you know, it's, it's odd. And you got to get folks back in the right position, but it can be done. So if you are going to do this, you know, photographs are helpful. Um, angulation, you can use just, you know, kind of a, um, and a roller, you know, just to kind of see what the angle of the knees and the hips are, really because you want to get that patient back as close um, as you can as possible. But I also caution too, and we are, implants are very quick, but I know sometimes starting out the implants can be a bit longer. You know, watch for pressure on the calves, you know, so put some sponges there if necessary. Um, you know, be careful to position, especially guys who've had artificial hips or knees. Um, and if you have you know, a big prostate, really extend those knees back a little bit, you know, as the patient can tolerate. Now they're going to be asleep and paralyzed. Oftentimes you can do it on the spinal, of course, local, but you can usually get them at position, which is relatively comfortable. Now I use sequential uh, compression devices, the SCDs, just to make sure, you know, just squeezes the calves and way to kind of prevent TBTs, things like that. I personally like them. It's a hospital rule, so I have to use them, but make sure they're turned on. There's been a few cases where someone forgot to plug them in. So, you know, just kind of those tips and tricks. The other thing is a Foley catheter. Now this can be a little controversial. I personally put a Foley catheter in. I know a lot of folks don't. I remember uh, before, before uh, Peter Grimm passed away, we you know, sometimes do these, um, you know, it's like where the old Muppet people would be, would be virtually in ORs. And the last one we did together before us passing was in Australia. And they were about to go put a Foley in. I said, that's great. And, you know, Peter started to scream, what are you doing? Absolutely not. And, you know, his big booming voice and who he was. Um, and I said, well, I use it. And his point is one, you know, if you put the bowl and you start to push it down, you can compress the prostate, you can change the shape, get it. So, you know, got to be careful when you do that. Make sure you're not tugging in the prostate. The other consideration was, well, what if I put a needle or right, you know, kind of on the catheter itself and I can go to shear that urethra versus just going through it, I can shear it. Um, again, with high quality ultrasounds, you know, we can really avoid where the, you know, where the, uh, the catheter is. 
Um, but also too, if you put it in, make sure you have a you know, clear line of sight for the urine because otherwise you cause an obstruction here in the prostate, the uh, bladder blows up and it can kind of push the prostate. So be careful. If you don't like the Foley catheter, you can use aerated jelly uh, to see the uh, urethra. End of the day though, you definitely want to see the urethra because that is one of our dose limiting, you know, structures and organ at risk, if you will, that we want to prevent uh, dose too. No intraoperative planning, you know, it eliminates the need for a pre-plan, you know, seed ordering it has to be done by nomogram. I'll show you mine. You get your prostate size on the ultrasound, um, CT, MRI. I use the MRIs or CTs, honestly. In fact, I use CTs mostly because it's easier. I'm mean, going to have the MRI volume by double checking on the CT so I can still do a volume study. But I put their legs up on the bo on a box. So I can kind of create dorsal, you know, a lithotomy position, the ultrasound, um, uh, CT suite, and um, look for any pubic arch interference. Um, you know, when you do all the trust in the OR, obviously you're contouring everything real time. So you're planning out what you see, so you can execute what you see. Yeah, so it's a little more tailored, a little more accurate, at least in my opinion. Uh, but then again, you need to consider delivery and accuracies. And what, you know, we do a lot of intraoperative planning with IPSA. So it's kind of, you know, IMRT for brachytherapy, do 500,000 iterations, but that has a tendency to have these mission critical seeds. One seed holds up the entire dose in one area. So you have to remember to keep it robust and go back um, to make sure that not one seed is going to hold everything up. Uh, we did a few implants like that. We went back to evaluate like, well, um, you know, shifting a seed two millimeters really made a difference. So you have to make sure that you want to stay robust and you kind of keep that, those tenants in mind. Um, so basically I have nomograms for my seed ordering. So this is for an iodine, uh, iodine cases, number of seeds I need for the volume of prostate based upon my seed activities, which are usually about 0 0.38 milliliters. And then also another little gut check, which I especially, like, and I always encourage the residents to do and, and folks is understand kind of where you are. So by rule of thumb is I implant about 0.7 to 0.79 milliliters per cc of plants. You know, some people implant more, some people implant less, but this is mine, my, based my outcomes on this, my outcomes are good. Um, so, you know, when I'm in the OR and we did a plan that calls for X amount of seeds, say, you know, 50 seeds and the uh, activity is you know, 0 0.38, we're gonna multiply those two things and divide by the uh, size of the prostate. That's a quick gut check that I'm in the realm of giving the amount of activity to per gland that I'm accustomed to giving to make sure there's no computer errors, things like that. Just uh, makes me feel better in a kind of way just to kind of you know, pause, take a breath, make sure you're, you're doing what you really want to do. Now I do interactive planning. So this is when we basically put the needles in after everything has been created in the contours of you know, the needles, the positions have changed based upon uh, where they actually go or don't go or you know if you want to put them on or if you want to make a shift to see what that will do you can do all of this so you can make some modifications on the fly can offset some delivery errors so that's why i kind of like it especially as we treat you know we train a lot of uh residents and actually a lot of urology folks as well um, which is good we uh, published the help technique this is something that we put together when i first came up to boston because everyone was doing things a little bit differently and i said hey you know you have this robotic delivery system they have this old robot that would actually put the seeds in which i uh, um, sort of uh, we get rid of it took forever but um <clears throat> but you could still put all the needles in so we called it help which i thought was kind of cute high dose rate emulating low dose rate prostate brachytherapy so you put all this all the needles in and then with intraoperative planning or the inverse planning you basically say, well, these are your needle positions. You know, they're kind of your surrogates for your, basically a catheters or, you know, they're light catheters. So it's like HDR. And the, uh, this position of where you want to put the seeds um, is, modif is based upon where those needles are. So you take a little bit of the uh, needle um, um, delivery errors out of the equation. We showed that we could um, get actually a better implant when we did things like that. Uh, this is pretty much my workflow, just, you know, for what it's worth. I just, I'm saying this only because we have the prostate school, which is going to be live uh, in Chicago, August 12th through 14th. So anyone who wants to see this technique amongst all a bunch of other techniques, we have, you know, of course we do high dose rate, we do low dose rate, we do free seeds, we do, um, you know, mix, we do intraoperative, we do um, intraoperative linking, which I do. So anything you want to see, you can, um, you can, you'll walk away looking at, you know, five or six different implant techniques. You can see which one kind of you, know, you feel the best with, or what I did when I first started out. I took you know all my mentors and I took a little piece of everything I did and I kind of put it to the way I thought that, you know would, would work well for what I had to do. Um, you know, patient gets positioned. I put stabilizing needles in the prostate. Why do I put stabilizing needles in? Does it really make the thing you know keep the prostate exactly in position? No, not really. But it's a fiducial marker to me. I've got two needles in there that help me know if the prostate shifted any works. I contour. I add that apical um, needle, so I push on the apex, know where the apex is, so I know where to stop my contours. 
do my volume study, contour the prostate, rectum, urethra, the fiducials, the catheter, um, uh, rectum, bladder, you name it, we contour everything because we're looking at doses to everything for research purposes. Uh, then we generate an automated, automatic inverse plan. Um, you know, you can base it upon the needle positions already there, or you could just say, have that a computer and just tell me where to put the free needles. And that's what I typically do because I've been doing this for a long time and can stand my needles pretty well. Get our DVH, we analyze it, we maximize our target dose, we minimize our urethral and rectal dose. So after this has all been done, it basically spits out, you know, the coordinates. This is where, you know, using these three-dimensional ultrasounds, this is where the seeds need to go. And this is what the seed train is supposed to look like. So I have someone, this is the barred quick clank. I just use the therogenic isoloter. Um, there's different solutions and they're all good, but you can make your, you know, you can have an infinite, you know, possibility when you're inverse planning, but if you want to link them all together, this is a way to link them together real time in the OR, which I like. So someone starts to link it all together for me. I go scrub, I put my gown on because we do this in the sterile conditions because we're on the OR is not where I'm at. Um, you know, typically five J needles have already been done by the time I've been walking to the room, get my gloves on and get ready to go. By the time I'm ready for the last uh, needle, they've all been constructed. So it's pretty quick. You know, real time needle insertion. So basically I'm watching, um, I'm landing on a runway, you know, we're helping to FDA approve this particular system. Um, you know, I used to like to fly and stuff. So it's like, here's a runway, right? Just land the damn needle. And if you're there, let the passenger seeds off. If you're not, go around and get back in position. Or if you think you're close enough, have your physicists update that position to where it is and see if it makes any change in the isodosis. Can we get away with it? Great. If not, go put it where it's supposed to be. Or do you want to make a modification? Well, let's see what that would look like. And again, the needle's a surrogate for the seeds, although, especially with the therogenic system, I must say you can see the seeds pretty well um, just because of how they, how they link everything together in this sort of plastic sleeve, which is pretty cool. Um, and then basically just updating the acidosis. This is what it looks like. That's me over here. This is my urologist, right, where I like to keep him. Um, he's actually great. Sometimes urologists don't come into the room. I do probably 90% of the implants uh, by myself or a resident, but um, some of the urologists do like to still participate, which I think is wonderful because it's team building. There's some uh, like physicists kind of driving the computers and all that stuff for me. Uh, someone linking everything up and just one person watching to make sure the needles are constructed correctly and point in the right places in the box. Uh, and this takes about 45 minutes uh, from stem to stern. So a pretty quick and drop it of, um, you know, we can move pretty quickly and get this all done fast. Uh, more considerations. Um, for those who are taking the SAMs, I think this might be one of your test questions. So what's the half-life of, um, you know, different half-lives, different activities, different um, isotopes, iodine 125 is about 60 days, palladium 17 days, cesium is 9.7 days. So your dose burns out a lot quicker using palladium or cesium, iodine is kind of the old tried and true. And then what are your typical strengths? You know, for um, iodine, it's 0.3 to 0.6 milliturys. For palladium, it's between one and two. Uh, season over 2.5 to 3.9. Um, but again, uh, half-life of iodine is about 60 days. Again, if you're taking the SAMs, you know, what are some prescription doses we're using? So monotherapy, iodine is about 145. And we'll be between 140 and 160. I use 145. If you're going to combine it with external beam, you know, typically we're giving between 42 to 50 gray of the pelvis. And then for to the prostate and some of that's called so if you do the ascend that to the pelvis and then your permanent you know, brachytherapy dose at least in this country is between 108 and 110. Now the ascend T trial used 115 and they had a lot of they had, you know, a fair amount of strictures. Maybe the dose was too much. I don't know. But so here I would say keep your dose around 108, 110. If I give 50, 40, I give 108 because really I'm dose painting. I should have done the second. If I give 40, then I, um, if I give 40, you know, 45, I give 110. Uh, you know, here's your doses for monotherapy for palladium, 110 to 125. If you're taking the test, monotherapy for um, cesium is about 115. Um, and then if you're going to combine, it's between 90 to 100 with um, palladium and um, 85 with um, <clears throat> cesium. But here's your test question right here. Monotherapy, cesium, 115. Remember that. Um, seed activity, you know, really there's no consensus on the optimal seed activity. There's a lot of papers you can read in the physics and see, you know, what might be better, you know, if you want to use more seeds, less seeds, higher activities, you know, if you're going to pay for seeds or not. Um, you know, basically in our TOG trials, you know, iodine is between 0.23, which is pretty low, to 0.43. Again, I use about 0.75 to 4. Um, I'm comfortable with that. Um, of course, you know, less activity, more seeds, possibly more forgiving. Obviously, there's a cost of seeds. Right now, it's a pass through to the patients. These current APMs, as they're written, we might have to pay for our seeds, and that comes out of the technical 
So my fear is that people are going to use a lot of just high, high activity seeds to maximize profit. Please don't do that. Use what you're comfortable with. Um, you know, a couple hundred dollars in the grand scheme, make sure that patient is doing well. Um, again, we talked about the palladium doses between one and two. And some have a range, some brachytherapists have a range of uh, um, activities depending on the gland size, monotherapy versus boost. I used to, I've actually stopped. Um, again, I'm using basically, you know, 0.375 to point, you know, 0.38 is so probably my average now. I use it for everything. Um, and we you know, manipulate a system with the inverse planning that feel comfortable that we're giving doses and our toxicity is fairly low. Now, seed placement is another thing that one has to decide. And there's some tips and tricks too. I mean, you can either do loose or stranded. Again, I use stranded and that's just sort of how I migrated to, but I did a lot of loose in my life as well with mix. And now I, you know, strand them together. Um, you know, loose seeds have a high probability of migrating, you know, and if they, but, you know, stranded seeds can too. You can still break off your strand. Um, you know, they may or may not, strand seeds may or may not approve your dose symmetry. It, 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 you can basically find seven articles to, you know, help with any opinion or that you want. It's what you feel comfortable doing. Because, I mean, honestly, both loose and stranded can shift and do shift, right? So you got to pay attention to it. But if you are going to use, you know, loose seeds, you know, know where your uh, migration routes are going to be. What are the anatomic channels? I mean, you know, interior venous complex right up here. Again, I showed you the uh, ultrasound uh, with high quality. You can see this with low quality ultrasounds, high to see. I start to throw some seeds there, they're going to go away. I did a lot of implants on the neck for fluoroscopy, and I just watched things float when I was first starting out. So I put another one in, but of course I had a seed going someplace I sure didn't want it to go. Uh, neurovascular bundles, you know, the five, seven o'clock position. There's a lot of nerve vessels here too. So you're off the prostate a little too low, you might want to see it float away. Um, you know, they most commonly go to the lung, but they can go to the heart, especially if someone has a PFO. Um, there's some reports the renal arteries and vertebral praxises. So you know, let's try to avoid you know, make, making things go where we don't want them to go. So stay away from the top of the prostate in the five and seven o'clock position. Rectal doses are important. Anyone uh, you know, who hasn't read this paper, I definitely encourage you to do it. Um, you know, Bill McLaughlin is, is great out of Michigan and he writes a lot of papers looking at MRIs and prostate anatomy and some of the variability. And I'll show you some of this stuff and as we go through this talk a little bit, but he has something he calls the Bermuda Triangle. And basically what the concept is, is when you put a probe into the rectum, you're changing the anatomy. You know, you're kind of flattening things out. You're making the rectum look a little further away than it actually is. You know, you kind of take the probe out. Things kind of go back to normal. It's like, ah, that was a little, you know, closer than I thought. You have some swelling. Those seeds go away. The swelling goes away. The seeds get closer. Um, just need to pay attention that we do do things uh, because we do change the anatomy of when we put a probe in. So uh, definitely just, you know, check this out. I think it's a lot of, there's a lot of tricks and tips in this too. Um, you want to go through a lot of stuff, so I don't want to dwell too much on this, but I think it's an important concept. We sell a lot of work in this arena. Also, too, you have to be paying attention to where your prostate is when you're doing the implants, especially with intraoperative, but also with pre-planning. You know, prostates can shift. Sometimes things set up. The prostate goes north on you, and you're still doing the implant as normal, and you're implanting down here, and your prostate's up there. Well, you've just missed all of that. That's a problem. You know, you can have seeds shift lateral, and you can have the prostate shift to the right or left. It's uncommon, but it can happen. It can kind of roll off the probe. Um, you know, again, if you're implanting this, this is where the dose is, you're missing that. Um, that's why I like to have those stabilizing needles in. It's a fiducial, like have a you know, point in space that I can go check to make sure there's no right or left shifts. Um, the most common thing that happens though is the prostate shifts, you know, towards the head, cephalad. Why? Because needle speed, you know, those of us, if you're doing the implant by yourself and you have a controlled needle speed, great. But if you're doing this with somebody else, a urologist or resident, and they're a little more tentative, but we know if we're not going, you know, pretty quickly through the prostate, you can push the prostate. And this is something that we all learn and you know, we get good at in terms of needle speed. That's slow needle speeds can push. Well, you push the prostate, you lose sight of your base and you just sort of continue as normal. Now you've dragged your needles down too well. Now you're talking about going to the G diaphragm, the sphinct external sphincters, and this is where you can kind of start to cause some, sphinct, um, some uh, strictures and whatnot. So you gotta pay attention to your anatomy and where your prostate went. Um, you know, prostates can settle or they can kind of just, you know, kind of go up a little bit again. And you're just going, do, 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 not paying attention. We just put a bunch of seeds. We don't want them. So just, you know, pay attention to your anatomy. That's all. But these are just cautionary tales. You know, but before you freak out and go, geez, I don't want to do this because that's bad. Don't forget, brachytherapy is relatively forgiving, believe it or not, because of the dose gradients. You know, when you're using iodine, you're decreasing the dose by 20 gray per millimeter. So if you offset by a few millimeters, you've dropped most of your dose away anyway. But again, why, you know, do something you don't need to do? 
But again, this is why you know, we can do well. We're not giving a whole lot of water dose. We're not giving a whole lot of rectal dose. And dose fall off is our friend. And that's one of our you know, advantages. We have incredible um, inverse square law is our friend. And we're giving the dose exactly where we need it. We're not going from the outside in. We're just taking care of what has to get taken care of. But whoops, I gave too much dose to the rectum. I wasn't paying attention. I just, you know, if I get seeds where I don't want them. I always keep some space away in the operating room just because, you know, if uh, you get residents, we don't like, we think we have too much rectal dose or they had beam and we're young and we're concerned that we don't want any rectal wall dose. I just pop, I just pop some hydrogel in. Um, you know, there's some building considerations around this, of course. But with that said, you know, the dose is falling there. Just uh, another thing is coming to market. We're doing a phase three trial um, at Dana Faber right now with this product. It's, uh, it's called Barigel. Basically, the same thing as um, um, Space OER, but instead of a uh, polymer that goes in a liquid and can kind of shift and go where it wants, this goes in as a gel to begin with. You can see it very, very, very well on ultrasound. So you can sculpt um, exactly where you want to put it. So it's really easy to get good apical coverage because I find sometimes with the uh, Space OER, I'm liking the best apical coverage because that's the tightest point. With this, you can kind of go from the micro and bring it down and really just pop everything up. And of course, if you want to um, get all some of the vesicle uh, coverage, or, you know, get some of those out of the way, this actually works well. So uh, this will be coming, I think, to vendor, you know, I think this will get FDA approved and soon, and this is something else you can be using. But, you know, having something in the OR is not a bad thing because, you know, too many seeds where you don't want them, put some gel in, you don't have to worry about the rectal dose. Because I think, you know, for a lot of folks, they, that's the most concerning thing. And I know folks at Dotmet and elsewhere, they put, you know, basically space wars on everybody. They say, hey, why not? Let's just limit the dose. And I also hear other people say, well, you know, it's a great way when you're training folks, like it's kind of like training wheels, you know? You're afraid of giving dose to the rectum. So, you know, just obviate it, you know, make it so the dose falls into the gel and not the rectum. And I, I, I must say, you know, for the younger guys I'm implanting, I do put a lot of this gels in just because I don't want any rectal dose. I don't want to, you know, have any considerations to, any potential secondary malignancies, even though we don't really see them, you know, based upon the literature. Um, again, I think I mentioned I use stabilizing needles as fiducials. This helps me know if I have a right or left lateral shift. And again, you know, I'm putting this apical needle in here for, to define my apex. Um, you know, pros and cons of the catheter. But you know, when I contour the catheter, that becomes another fiducial for me. So we talked about, you know, the fact that you could, you know, cut into it or, you know, change the shape of the prostate and tug. But again, it becomes another fiducial to me. So I like it. Um, the other thing, you know, if you implant enough, you're always going to come across a guy where you're trying to put the probe in, like, what the heck? It's not going in. It's because just the way the sigmoid colon is, you know, kind of going to the left or right or, you know, whatnot. And you don't want to push, 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 because you can cause a lot of issues with these guys. And I sometimes, you know, see some of the residents, you know, being aggressive, like, oh, slow down. If it's not going in easily, we need to find a better path. And typically, you just have to, you know, kind of curve the needle down and not the needle, the ultrasound probe down a little bit follow the contour and you can get past the prostate because we do everything sagittal based on implants and the sagittal crystals mid shaft, whereas the um, you know, transverse crystals up at the top. So, you know, obviously you have to get this a little deeper in. And because of that, you, know, you need to really pay attention to anatomy. So don't push if you find resistance, just change your angulation, typically pulling it down is the way to go. And I always say, how many implanters are too many? You know, seed implants by committee are probably not the best. You know, sometimes we have a urologist, maybe a fellow, or, you know, a resident, you know, a medical student around if he wants to put something in. Uh, I think it's time to ask for trouble when having too many people do it. I mean, obviously we have to teach and train, so, you know, but you have to kind of find what your comfort is. You know, too many, everyone has a different needle speed, track speed, things like that. Um, sometimes you have suboptimal implants, um, even with the best supervision. It's just because of the feel and where they drop the initial seed it might be too low, too high. So implants by committee, be careful of. I know a lot of us in academics, we're kind of stuck with it, but you got to be careful. Um, and we do treatment planning timeouts, you know, you have the correct isotope, right? Manufacture of the isotope, correct seed activity, correct date time, correct data sets, all of this stuff, correct uh, magnification on the ultrasound, you name it. Um, just so we, you know, we have these little stop points as we're doing that procedure, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And you, know, you do these enough that it becomes almost so routine. You become too routine, you know, you get really good at what you do, but it becomes almost second hat. So you got to put some of these uh, these stops in place just to keep yourself honest and make sure you're not making any mistakes. So where our OCHEM's so good, it all comes down to dose. It's, you know, dose matters. Um, you know, meta-analysis, biochemical control, function of radiation dose, every, you know, one gray in dose, you, you can pretty much decrease biochemical failure by 1.8%. Uh, this bores out with all the external beam dose escalation studies. And if you look at, you know, Jeff Mikulski's RTOG0126, 
um, probably the most contemporary 1500 people on intermediate risk disease, you know, 70 versus 79 gray. Your biochemical control goes from 55 to 70 if you go up to 79 gray, you have that extra nine gray. Of course, I would still say 70 gray is pretty, 70% biochemical control for intermediate risk disease is pretty pitiful because, you know, breaking eclipses that, of course, but just goes to show your dose matters. Um, you know, Mike Zalewski did this, Michael Zalewski did this, you know, kind of interesting study two and a half years of giving different doses of radiation, the biopsies, low doses, almost everybody was positive, even with high doses, 15% of the catheterectomy radiation, even high doses was still positive. Now he did this with, and if you look at the overall positivity rate, it was about 32%. He did, repeated this study for SBRT, which was smart, right? But he was still getting 8% biopsy positive at 40 gray, which is a pretty heroic dose. I mean, you gotta be really careful when you're kind of giving that dose. And this is kind of more in line of what most people do at you know 17% positive biopsies and 21% overall. So SBRT might be a little better than IMRT, but surely isn't as good as breaking. So Stock and Stone basically did the same thing. And when they looked at 508 men, their final positivity rate was about 7.7%. So not 32%, not 21%, but 7.5%. You know, and, and if you had a high dose, high quality implant, it was more like 1.5%. Again, dose matters. We can get more dose when we put radiation seeds into the prostate. Um, HDR, um, you know, brachytherapy, I'm just showing this slide because it's actually an interesting study versus SBRT. It doesn't matter, seeds, HDR, you're getting more dose conformally into the prostate with brachytherapy. And this is, you know, we just saw the biopsy data. This is going to, you know, pour out. My concern is when these APMs come in, we get the same amount of money, the only thing we want. You know, for monotherapy, a lot of the brachytherapists are going to be making a lot of money, but those who don't want to go to the OR, they're just going to do SBRT, five fractions, blow my contour. It took me a few minutes, I'm going to get the same amount of money. But they're not going to get the same controls, I guarantee you, because we can give more dose and we can we show dose matters. I like to share the Rodriguez's trial. This is like stone beam radiation, contemporary greater than 70 gray, all risk categories from extremely low to extremely high. After five years, it's just a much to the, you know, to down. Extreme beam radiation therapy falls off. You know, when you're looking at brachytherapy after five years, basically it's, except for the very, very high risk patients, it pretty much levels off. This has been shown in the Ascend.T data sets. This has been shown by the original 15 year Seattle data combined modality therapy. And then if you haven't felt by five years, you typically don't. What extreme beam would do. So I always like to say a truth is PSA is our tool. You know, a rising PSA condemns many men to expensive, toxic, and quality of life reducing treatments. And, you know, is society prepared for the cost to normalize overall survival? Well, I'd be pretty pissed off myself if I had something that wasn't offered to me that would prevent me from having to have lifelong, you know, androgen deprivation therapy. That's my bias, of course. All right, so again, let's just look at risk groups, low to medium high, you know, I do a high risk talk. And you know, when, when you look at extra capsule extension disease behind the, beyond the prostate, it get, it's really high at high risk. I mean, I, you know, taking guys with high risk disease to, you know, surgery, they're almost all gonna get, you know, beamed afterwards, which is kind of a double whammy, I think I'm fear. Even low risk guys have a chance of extra capsule extension. So I always, you know, kind of go to Davis's study, a lot of Mayo. And, you know, interesting stuff, old mom pathology slides. And, you know, bottom line, if you get, you know, Gleason score 10, less than, uh, Gleason score seven, PSI less than 10, volume less than 60, usually you're going to find this within a half a millimeter or so from the prostate. You know, we, we put in treatment margins of three to five millimeters. So we, we're going to encompass a lot of this extra capsule extension. People have it. We know they do. Put a margin around. That's our advantage. That's radiation's advantage. Even external beams advantage. We set up a kill zone around the prostate because we can't. Surgeons can't. They can only lift it out because if they try to scoop all this around it, they're going to cause a lot of bleeding, a lot of problems, and you know, men might not survive the operation. So they only can lift it out. It's not their fault, but if the cancer's there, that's staying behind. We can treat that. That's our advantage. So if we are going to treat that and we do need a margin, well, we better make sure that we maintain that margin after treatment. Now, these both have V100s of so, you know, basically 100%. Everything here is covered, though. Here, no, it's still a great implant. The entire prostate's covered. But oops, we missed the extra capsule extension. Now, dose, you know, we're still giving some dose there, 90 70%. Maybe that's enough for microscopic disease. But again, when you do, if you, if you mean to treat outside the prostate with you know, isodose cloud, make sure you do. You know, these margins aren't to make your dosimetry look, look good, especially for high risk men, to make sure they have good biochemical control. Same D90, same D100, different outcomes. Tumor, tumor. Same numbers, but you miss the tumor, you miss the tumor. So be very careful, obviously, with replacing the needles and seeds. 
seminal vesicle invasion questions always come up. Can you plant the seminal vesicles? Yes, you can. You can do it very easily with seeds. You can do it with HDR. Um, there's three different studies. I always show test and studies. It's like one of the first ones out. But you know, seven percent, fewer than seven percent of patients had seminal vesicle invasion beyond one centimeter. Again, that's what the old ultrasounds look like. That's what I trained on. We were treating the seminal vesicles all the time because we couldn't see the takeoffs. And this is basically a good image, but these are seminal vesicles over here. We're implanting those. We can't implant them. I use link seeds. That way they don't get ejaculated out to an orgasm. Um, we do day 30 CTs and MRI to make sure it holds up and it does hold up. Uh, if they have gross extra gross seminal vesicle invasion, maybe you can do a high dose rate. Another thing that I want to point out is just neurovascular bundles. Um, you know, many robotic surgeons are now trying to spare the uh, robot and the neurovascular bundles, but this is an issue because that's a path of least resistance. They're penetrating branches of the nerves. This is a highway for cancer to come out with brachytherapy. We can give doses out to these areas. Nerves and arteries, veins are pretty radio resistant. So we can kind of track down and kill cancer without having to spare the uh, neurovascular bundles. Local recurrence, if you're taking the test, local recurrence occurs at the site of dominant nodule, dominant lesion. So if you know where the, local, if you know where the dominant lesion is, you have your biopsy map, you know where the majority of cancer is, boost it, give it a little more, why not? I put seeds back to back. I'm not afraid to do that as long as it's not near the rectum of the urethra. So I try to give 200% of my acidosis line to where the cancer is. I talked before, I try to give 150% of my dose to the entire peripheral zone, because that's when we know 95% of cancers are gonna be hiding out. 200% to the thing, 100% to the tumor, 100% to the entire gland. Um, this is where I'm, my, my strategy when I go in and keeping my urethral dose is very low. My V125 less than 1 cc and nothing of the 100, uh, 150. Excellent at what cost? Well, I give guys very up with cocktails. This has been something, you know, literature is in all different directions, but in my practice, it helps well. I started already on Flomax a week before, you know, 0.4 milligrams at bedtime. That way if they get dizzy with sleeping. I sometimes will increase it to 0.8 after the implant if they're having a lot of, um, you know, sort of bother and obstructive-like symptoms. Typical duration is about two half-lives. So for um, iodine, they're taking it basically for four months and for palladium, usually a month or two months. I give everybody Mobook or Celebic, COX-2 inhibitor, easier on the gut, 30 days, helps with swelling, also helps with, you know, dysuria, which we can cause. Antibiotics are plus minus. I still do them for a couple of days. Do you need to? Probably not, but you know, maybe I throw back to the old days. Everybody has proliferium, so if they have me burning in urination at two in the morning, they can go to the medicine cabinet versus making a call. Direction maintenance, it's psychological as much as physiological. We poked and prodded on that prostate. Guys have cancer, they just went through a surgery. The wife's sometimes concerned. I don't know if we should be having sex. You know, it's fine to have sex if you want. Um, so don't be afraid to throw a little Viagra things. I also love each of them just to kind of help because psychologically, you have a couple of bad performances. That sticks in the guy's brain. Um, so try to avoid that. Again, location matters. In my opinion, we're starting to look at some of this data set. It really is where the urethra is getting the dose. You know, down the membranous urethra, that's where strictures come. You, you know, the mid gland urethra is probably a little more forgiving. Of course, when you get to the um, try on the bladder neck, then we can have a little more sensitivities. Um, we're getting close on time. <clears throat> You know, the Ascend.T trial, so those who didn't want to see the doubling of biochemical control at the point T threshold, are basically, you know, absolute benefit of about 20, 25% in the intermediate high-risk settings. If that was a pharmacological, that would be a multi-billion dollar drug. They saw the toxicity. They said, well, there's no overall survival benefit. It was just PSA control. Well, PSA control keeps you from toxic salvage treatments. But then the distractors were saying, well, but, you know, geez, it's so much more toxic. Look, grade three. Toxicity, GU, significant 19 versus 5%. Now, most of those, 50% were urethral structures. A lot of them were just, you know, kind of moving the catheter for a day or two. And I, you know, we've all been there. We all know it. Sometimes <laughs> your urology colleagues are like, keep that catheter. And I always pull mine, keep it in. It's the weekend. I, I don't want them to have any calls. I'm like, well, that's no good, but that would, be, that would get gray as a grade three. And that's human nature, not toxicity of the implant. But again, I showed you ways to avoid those you know, below the apex. And if you do that, we can avoid this. And I think that's the next section on of what we do with the next frontier of brachytherapy. What we do is pay attention to the um, external sphincters, use MRIs, uh, MR markers, all kinds of different things. Know where not to give dose. And this number I know we can drive down so it would not be significant. But it was, and that's what the detractors are going to show you. But I think I hopefully showed you ways to avoid it. And just at the end, Post-implant evaluation and program quality assurance are paramount. It has to be done. It has to be done. You have to know what you're doing. You cannot turn a blind eye. You can't say, I did the implant, everything is great. You got to critically evaluate everything. You know, we made the front page of the New York Times uh, when we 
folks at the Philadelphia VA, you know, kind of forgot to check to see what they were doing. Um, you know, it happens, but a lesson learned to all of us. It can happen to anybody, right? So you get a QA. It's extremely important. You have to know if your technique's working. Maybe you want to do something else. Maybe you want to switch the pre-planner. Maybe you want to interrupt. Maybe you want to go back to what you were doing before. Is it working? Are you achieving your dosimetric goals, acceptable toxicities, good outcomes? And on post-implant CT, be careful. I mean, everyone should have a day zero or day 30 CT, but it's easy to lose your anatomy with seeds in place. And seeds, I swear to God, scream out and say, circle me, circle me, circle me. Uh, Juanita corrected an interesting study. It's, you know, it's almost 20 years old now, but you've got a bunch of experienced, you know, kind of brachytherapists together, had them contour. Based on the apex, they were all over the place. And so what are some solutions? You can have a third party contouring, you can use your trust volume incorporated in your post plan. You have the trust, you know what you're implanting an ultrasound. Make sure you're using that at day 30, especially if you just have a CT. We'll do a CTMR fusion. Everybody I have, I'm blessed that you know, we can still get this all paid for, but everyone gets a CTMR fusion. So I'm contouring the anatomy of the MRI and the seeds on the CT. So the implant is what it is and you really can't cheat. Um, again, it has to be done. Good way to get seed count. You need to have DVHs for your prostate when you doing your rectal metrics. Why CTMR fusion? Well, seed out effect on CT makes it difficult. You just, you know, honestly, they call to you like the siren saying, just contour me, contour me, contour me. You can have an artificially low D90, D100 if you overestimate the prostate, artificially high D90, D100 if you just circle the seeds. Um, look how great I'm doing. Now you're circling the seeds, you're not circling the anatomy. CT is better for C vocalization, MRI is better for anatomy. And, and again, I'm pointing you back to McLaughlin. Um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty well known. MR shows you the anatomy so much better. It is so easy on CT to kind of get that G diaphragm. It looks like prostate on CT, it's in the Hansfield gene. So how do you know? It's easy to grab the takeoff of the seminal vesicle. You just don't see it. It's, it's the same Hansfield's field. You know, it's MRI distinguishes it a lot better. So you have a better indication of what you're actually doing. Um, that's why we use a lot of MRIs. And I think that's why toxicities are so good because we're not down here. You know, we know to stop here. And again, I think I mentioned it's a lot of anatomic variation. Some folks have sphincters that are centimeter you know, in length, some of them are millimeter. Again, I think there's a lot to do why some people are wet and dry after surgery, um, just basically with these cuts and being made. <clears throat> so if the MR is not available, you know, use all the information you have. Implant volume study, you have it, you know, pre or intraoperative, you have the length width height, use it, you know, go find it. Overall volume, especially to the CT, it's like, wait a second, I'm contouring all the way down here, but I was only implanting to here. And ultrasound, where I know I saw something, because I put that apical needle, like crazy guy was talking about, so I knew not to go past it. Overlay, fuse your ultrasound, which would post op CT, you can use some water contrast. All right, so basically, in summary, if you have high quality implants basically mean you have to have a good patient selection. You know which, how to use an ultrasound to have a good quality ultrasound, contour the right things, make sure you know where the apex is. You have to design a curative plan. You have to have adherence to your planning technique. You know, don't go off kilter and now I might just do something completely different today. You know, if you get a protocol, stick with it. You get to execute that plan correctly. If the prostate starts moving around and shifting, stop. Get it back in position. Don't keep going. Know where it's happening. It's happening. Keep your operating room protocols, adhere to them. And you have to do post opto symmetry, peer review. Check your toxicities, look at your PSA outcomes. Are you doing the right thing for patients? Are you selecting the patients correctly? Are your toxicities appropriate? Now I say, just be proficient in what you do. Honestly, evaluate your technique and strive to improve outcomes. So in conclusion, thoughtful patient selection leads to optimal patient outcomes. One treatment approach does not fit all. Know what to implant and leverage the physics of radiation seeds to achieve your goal. And continuous post-implant evaluation is paramount to the success of your program. So let's make brachytherapy sexy again. We're fighting SVRT. I'm telling you, SVRT is coming hot and heavy because it is easier to do and the APM is going to support it. APM also supports brachytherapy. We should be getting back in the ORs. Let's go and do it. All right, with that, I'm gonna thank you and take any questions you may have. So there's one uh, question here. How do you contour the urethra for dosimetric purposes? We do put a Foley catheter in on day 30. You can see it on MRI, but it's sort of hit or miss. To me, it's a poor man's you know, sort of op opening things up. Um, do we strictly adhere to the prostate urethra getting less than 150? We absolutely do. We absolutely do. Um, that's, it's kind of a no-go for us. We really pay attention to that. All righty. Well, that's what I have. I think uh, with the webinar, I don't think there's tons of opportunities to ask much.
uh, more than that. And I know we've come at time. So I just want to thank you for your participation and being here tonight. Uh, just a quick plug, ABS is going to have their annual meeting from June 22nd to June 25th. Registration is now open. It will be a virtual meeting. And those of you who want to come share a uh, drink and have some elbow to elbow fun, come see us in Chicago, August 12th through 14th. So with that, I'm gonna thank you all for your participation tonight and uh, happy implanting. Good night and goodbye.